A Charles Dickens, Childhood, Chapter 1. It's the 1870s on a Saturday afternoon in Warsaw. A father is reading to his children. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness. It was the epic of belief. It was the epic of incredulity. It was a season of light. It was the season of darkness. It was the spring of hope. It was the winter of despair. And that comes from A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens, published in 1859. <clears throat> Charles Dickens doesn't know his story is delighting a little girl in Poland. This precocious child growing up in a war-torn country and bearing tragedy within her family will live a life of two cities, Warsaw and Paris. If Dickens had used her as a model for his book, his, fa his fiction would instead be fact and outshine his tale of two cities because the story of Marie Curie is true. The home setting for Marie's life is a mother and father devoted to the family, education, and their country. The political setting for Marie's childhood is Warsaw in the second half of the 1800s, under the thumb of the Russian Tsar who denies the Polish people their culture, language, and independence. For those who have never experienced living with the daily degradation of tyranny, here is some background. Poland, once the largest nation in all of Europe, has been divided and conquered for the last 120 years. Not until the end of World War I, 1918, will the name Poland appear on a map again. Of the conquering countries, Russia, Prussia, and Austria, ruling over segments of Poland, Russia, is the harshest. Russians quash a Polish revolt in 1830 and the Poles will pay for this literally and figuratively. The Russian Tsar has a citadel built in the middle of Warsaw. Covering 89 acres, the construction requires 76 buildings to be demolished, which displaces 15,000 residents. Adding to this public incursion, the cost of the citadel walls and buildings, 139 million, is paid for by the Polish citizens. The number of citadel barracks means that 5,500 Russian troops are now in the city. Positioned on the walls are 555 pieces of artillery that ensures 360 degree coverage of Warsaw and its citizens. In 1863, the Poles attempt a second uprising and once again, they are crushed by the Russians. The Russian reprisal this time includes 70,000 Polish citizens imprisoned, 396 executed, 18,672 exiled to Siberia, 1,660 Polish estates are confiscated, and a 10% tax as a war indemnity is incurred. As a reminder, the following year, the Citadel has five bodies hanging from the ramparts for several days. Killed for their role in the revolt, these Polish leaders now serve as reminders of the fate for any other heroes who think they can overthrow the Russian regime. The entrenched torment of the public penetrates the walls of Polish homes, warping the logic of daily decisions. How do you raise children who are smart and gifted to reach for the stars when that reach could have them sent to Siberia? Encouraging your child with today's mantra, be so good they can't ignore you, could get them killed. Marie's family does not escape the trauma permeating their city or the stench filling the air as the hot August sun beats down on the hanging bodies that are decomposing. This setting for Russian revenge is a few blocks 
from the Frida Street School, where Marie's mother is a teacher. In the years to come, Marie and her sisters walk by the Russian citadel every day on their way to school. <clears throat> Marie's father is Vladislav Sklodowsky. His plans are to attend the Warsaw University as his father had done. The problem for Vladislav is Warsaw University was shut down by the Russians. Maneuvering around that disappointment means Vladislav must travel 750 miles north to attend a Russian university in St. Petersburg. Following graduation, Vladislav's list of languages to read and speak includes English, French, German, Russian, Greek, Latin, and of course, Polish. Vladislav also loves music and literature. He returns to his home in Warsaw as Professor Vladislav Sklodowski. Vladislav, 28 years old, is employed as a teacher of mathematics and physics. He, pl he is planning to marry Bronislava Bokuski. Bro Bronislava Bokuski, who plays piano and sings beautifully has grown up in a family that believes in educating their daughters. She attends Frida Street School, the only private school for girls in Warsaw. In spite of being monitored by Russian officials, this is the best possible education for a girl in Poland. Bronislava becomes a teacher at Frida Street School. Like Vladislav, she is devoted to education. They are a perfect match. And as an aside, Polish names for women end with an A, and for men, an I. Bronislava and her daughter's last name is Sklodowska. Vladislav and his son's last name is Sklodowski. Back to the text. After the wedding, Bronislava is promoted to headmistress of the school. The position includes a large apartment where she and Vladislav will live. During the next several years, Bronislava must balance the dual role of career and mother. In seven years, she bears five children. And those children are Sophia, a daughter born in 1862, Joseph, a son born in 1863. Bronislava, who later is referred to as Bronya, is born in 1864. Helena, a daughter referred to as Hella, is born in 1866. And Maria, daughter, referred to as Manya, is born in 1867. Maria will later write her name as Marie. Until that time in her story, we will know her as Maria or her pet name, Manya. With both parents being educators, every opportunity at home is a teaching moment that covers weather, nature, science, math, and literature. Polish history, which is forbidden in the Russian schools, is taught at home. The children all know Russian, French, and English, as well as their native language, Polish. Bronislava is feeling the toll from running the school, five pregnancies, and she has the additional duties of nursing Vladislav's brother, who has come to stay with them. The brother has terminal tuberculosis. Bronislava wistfully says to a friend, I must confess that I wouldn't mind being Miss Broguski again now that I see how difficult a woman's life is. A year after Maria is born, Vladislav has a new job, which will mean a pay increase and an apartment. For Bronislava, with her duties of motherhood, the new home is too far to commute each day to work. She decides to leave her position at the Frida Street School and dedicate her time to teaching Sophia and Joseph at home. To help with family finances, Bronislava has learned to be a cobbler. She makes and repairs the shoes of her children. The older siblings are all very bright, but Maria stands out. As a four-year-old preschooler, Maria is listening to her sister Bronya, who's three years older, struggling to read a passage in a book. Maria is impatient, picks up the book, and reads it aloud, perfectly. The family is astonished. Maria misunderstands 
her parents look of surprise and exclaims, I didn't do it on purpose. It, it was because it was so easy. Not only is their little Manya a self-taught reader, her curiosities are not the norm. There's a glass cabinet in the family room where Maria's father keeps scientific instruments. Other children pass by this case and do not give it a moment's notice. Not so for Maria. She remembers being fascinated with the, quote, several shelves laden with surprising and graceful instruments, glass tubes, small scales, specimens of minerals, and even a gold leaf electroscope, end quote. For Vladislav, these treasures of his trade are a silent display to a dream of research denied to him by Russian rules. The world will never hear his name, Vladislav Sklodowsky, in reference to a brilliant career in physics, but they will hear of his daughter. The government's decree to cut the number of hours to teach science in school won't stop this father from teaching his own children at home. Following the failure of the 1863 uprising, plans of resistance by the Polish people turn from direct revolt, sorry, direct revolts to the oblique approach of increasing the intelligentsia class. The ensuing emphasis on education might sound like perfect timing for the teachers Vladislav and Bronislava, but a wrench comes with the Russians. Polish students wanting to continue their education or qualify for jobs must leave Polish schools and attend government-run Russian schools to receive authorized diplomas. In this paradox for Polish families, no Polish history or culture is taught and their language is forbidden. The twist tightens on Polish parents knowing their children are being subjected to Russian propaganda and derisive treatment. Economic oppression by the Russian government includes replacing head teachers with their own candidates. Vladislav must accept that he will only be an assistant teacher and work under the suspicious eye of a Russian. Vladislav stays with his job in the Russian school in hopes of being a supportive influence for the Polish students and ensure a better education for them. Vladislav's decision to teach in this setting is an example of the harrowed life up for Polish adults who must balance how to submit to Russian authorities, stay true to their Polish nationalism, and withstand criticism from fellow Poles who see anyone taking a job with the government as a sellout. Both families of Vladislav and Bronislava have stood their ground against the Russians. Vladislav's brother, wounded twice in the uprising, has escaped to France. Another brother, teaching law at the Warsaw University, is demoted to the job of a notary in the countryside. Bronislava's brother, captured in the 1863 uprising, is one of the thousands sent in chains to Siberia. Aside from the physical suffering, this family and thousands of others must learn to live with diminished incomes, loneliness, and loss of support from family. Living by carpe diem can make life miserable. The year 1871 ushers in tragedy for the Sklodowsky family. Bronislava is losing weight and coughing. Contracted while nursing her brother-in-law, Bronislava has tuberculosis. And as an aside, an explanation of tuberculosis. At the time, tuberculosis, TB, is often called consumption because it consumes and destroys the body. Causing lumps on human tissue, especially the lungs, it is a deadly disease. The consumption includes the helplessness that consumes the entire household. Permeating every room of the house is the sound of the patient's constant coughing. Back to the text. The family's routine changes. Aside from Bronislava using separate dishes and eating utensils, she also withdraws her physical affection for the children. For this loving family, the loss of intimacy, 
no kisses, no hugs, no sitting on your mother's lap, is made worse because as custom of their time, no explanation is given to Maria. No one connects for Maria the reason for her mother's restraint is because of her mother's disease. Family evening prayers include restore our mother's health. Maria is only four years old. Bronislava and the oldest daughter, Sophia, leave for nice, <clears throat> or I'm sorry, Nice, France in 1872, hoping the warmer climate will be a cure. Any assumption this is a vacation is an error. Bronislava is homesick for her family, exhausted from the disease, and Vladislav is managing a house with four children. Bronislava and Sophia are home one time during their two years away. And there is, um, in the text, a beautiful photo of all five children. And then after that, when her mother goes back, she won't see her mother again for a whole year. Maria has started first grade at the Frida Street School, where her mother had been headmistress. By third grade, Maria is moved to a Polish school closer to home. The headmistress, with nerves of steel, is Jadwiga Sikorska, Sikorska, combating Russian control yet showing kindness to her students, Madame Sikorska lives with the constant threat of a one-way ticket to Siberia. Being monitored by Russian officials, Madame Sikorska risks her job and her life as she keeps dual schedules for her students. Everyone, from staff to students, is involved in a collusion knowing Polish history is listed under botany, and Polish literature is actually German studies. If an inspector is approaching, a bell is rung and the Polish books are swept into a hiding place. When the inspector walks into the classroom, a Russian book or an embroidery project is on the child's desk. Madame Sikorska describes the strain of living a parallel life in her diary, and she writes, it's a hard life, a double life, we had to do our best to protect and cultivate all that was dear and sacred to us. And at the same time, we had to be able to satisfy the authorities in order to be able to keep working. I don't think I ever lied to the authorities in the presence of my students, but they were all used to lying anyway, living in a constant state of conspiracy. <clears throat> That's the end of her quote. And Maria plays her part in the conspiracy. Ranking first in arithmetic, history, literature, German, French, and Russian, it is also Maria who is called upon when inspectors visit. The pressure is on Maria, the youngest in the class, to answer correctly, uphold the facade, and convincingly betray her beliefs. She knows any misstep could cause violent consequences for her fellow students, Madame Sikorska, and Maria's family. The inspector asks, Name all the Russian czars since Catherine II, and what are the names and titles of the reigning royal family? And for punitive measures, he asks, Who rules over us? Maria must answer, His Majesty Alexander II, czar of all the Russians. When the inspector leaves, Maria is in tears. As an aside, schools for boys and girls are monitored by Russian officials and their sexist assumptions are to the girls' advantage. The girls' school is under less scrutiny by inspectors since Russians surmise that women not entering, not entering public life or politics, they are not a threat. Back to the text. The Sklodowsky family finds relief from the strain of constant surveillance during their vacation time spent with relatives in the country. In these areas of Poland, under the less restrictive control of Austria, the family can speak Polish, sing patriotic songs without fear of being sent to prison. Maria writes, There we found the free life of the old-fashioned family estates, races in the woods, and joyous participation in the work in the grain fields. End quote. The reprieve is short-lived. 
Tension at work is rising for Vladislav. Teaching in a Russian school does not forego the intrusion of Russian inspectors. Inspectors review the students' homework, not for errors, but for any evidence of Polish terms. When one of the students has made this mistake, Professor Sklodowski won't berate the child, and instead he tells the inspector, quote, if that child made a mistake, it was certainly only a slip. It happens that you too write Russian incorrectly at times, and indeed fairly often. I'm convinced you do not do it deliberately any more than the child does, end quote. Skating on thin ice of Russian empathy, Vladislav will pay for this small act of defiance. Returning home from the family summer vacation, there is a letter of dismissal waiting. Vladislav is being replaced by a Russian. Aside from the loss of income, they have also lost their living quarters. It's 1873. Maria is six. To cover this loss of income and his wife's medical expenses, Vladislav opens his home to take in boarders. Over the next 10 years, the Sklodowski home will have 10 to 20 students staying in their apartment with them. Maria sleeps on the couch. She must get up early enough to clear away her bedding and set the breakfast table for everyone. Joseph remembers, when I think about that time, the impression I have is of some kind of beehive where the noise and commotion never ended. We, the Sklodowski children, returned from school each day. We ate lunch all together, about 20 people, and then we would sit down to study. Every corner of our apartment was then filled with students, not only those who lived with us, but also those who came to study. End quote. Maria, who will always prefer privacy, she writes, the house was transformed into a noisy barracks and intimacy vanished from our family life. In the fall of that year, Bronislava and Sofia are home again. Maria can run and hug her sister, but not her mother. The convalescing trip was not, has not cured Bronislava's tuberculosis and the joy of being together again as a family is only for a short time. For two years, a typhus epidemic rages Warsaw, I'm sorry, ravages Warsaw, killing thousands. Having borders in their home brings typhus to the family. January 1874, Maria's sister, Sophia and Bronya are both suffering symptoms. And as an aside about typhus, it is transmitted by lice and rat fleas in dirty clothes and bedding. The symptoms are flu-like and include fever, chills, and headaches. A rash develops on the trunk and spreads. If terminal, the patient suffers an end with delirium or in a coma. Back to the text. In the Sklodowski household, Bronislava is in one bedroom coughing, while Bronya and Sofia are in the another room with raging fevers. It's hard to imagine how Bronislava must have suffered, not just physically from her illness, but emotionally as a mother, unable to care for her daughters in the next room. Bronya, sick for 12 days, recovers. Sophia does not. When she dies, the family is in shock. Joseph writes, I still can't think about her without sorrow. January 31st has been, since her death, the first painful anniversary in my calendar. Maria sees her sister in the coffin, dressed in white. Hella writes, Our sister's death literally crushed our mother. She could never accept the loss of her oldest child. End quote. Bronislava's grief is coupled with guilt and nagging doubt. Sophia might have survived if she had not been weakened with the travel and care of her mother. Joseph remembers the overwhelming sorrow of his mother, and he writes, She had to be almost physically forced to stay home because she was too ill to go out on the day of her funeral. End quote. Vladislava and the four remaining children walk behind the coffin. Maria is wearing Sophia's black coat. 
Desperate to catch the final moments before her daughter is buried, Bronislava moves from window to window to watch as the funeral procession passes by the house. To help pay for his wife's medical expenses, Vladislav invests his savings in a business venture suggested by his brother-in-law. The prospect fails, and Vladislav loses everything. This was the money meant to help his children continue their education at universities. His one hope, the vision of seeing his children have a better life, is now lost. Vladislav must also bear the weight of knowing he is losing his wife. The children know this too. Maria, in her prayers, asks God to take her instead. The soul of the family is dying. Bronislava calls her family to her bedroom. Upholding her Catholic traditions, she makes the sign of the cross over her children's heads. She tells them, I love you. There is no last kiss or a warm embrace to hold as a memory in the years ahead. Bronislava dies the next day, May 9th, 1878. Maria is nine years old. Vladislav has buried a daughter, and now he must bury his wife. He will mourn his beloved wife all of his life, and he never remarries. Ten years later, he writes this poem. An angel whose celestial light brightened my house and chased every shadow off my forehead. When she left, my whole world turned into a cemetery. Maria remembers and writes, this catastrophe was the first great sorrow of my life. For many years we all felt weighing on us the loss of the one who had been the soul of our house. End quote. The grief of losing a sister and her mother, the financial insecurity of her family, their home being overrun with borders, the double life in both the public and the school is taking its toll on this nine-year-old child. Hella remembers that time for Maria and writes, she would often sit in some corner and cry bitterly. Her tears could not be stopped by anybody. After her mother's death, Maria is indifferent to any religious beliefs and escapes to her books. Maria calls this time a lost happiness and later writes this apt self-description I feel everything very violently with a physical violence. Maria's fragile state has not gone unnoticed by her teacher, Madame Sikorsky, or Sikorska, excuse me. She suggests to Vladislav that he keep Maria back a year. Vladislav disagrees. He is aware of his daughter's brilliance and enrolls her in a Russian school. They called their schools gymnasiums and it's gymnasium number three. Maria will start in the fall. Vladislav, in spite of the loss of his helpmate, does not allow the family regimen to crumble. Education continues to be a firm foundation. A walk is an opportunity to talk about science, and during evening meals, the conversation includes the culture of other countries. Following dinner, there is time to exercise the body as well as the brain. Vladislav teaches his children geography and military history using colored blocks. He risks buying forbidden Polish books of literature. Saturday nights are spent translating into Polish, reading aloud to the children David Copperfield or A Tale of Two Cities. Vladislav pours into his children's spirits a love of learning and an unbeatable passion for life. Helena remembers... I still remember how enthusiastically we participated in those lessons. Equal standards are held for his daughters and his sons. There is no diminishing the dreams of his daughters with talks of ending their education and getting married. Vladislav is 100 years ahead of his time. Maria, Maria's beginning days at the gymnasium <clears throat> school are difficult. She remembers, quote, this period of my early youth darkened by mourning and the sorrow of oppression, end quote. A break in the cloud comes with her new friend, Kasia. 
Kazia's family has an enormous has an apartment in the palace of Ka of a count. Kazia's mother is a librarian for the count. Maria knocks on the palace door every morning for Kazia to walk with her to school. At the end of the school day, Kazia's mother has lemonade and chocolate ice cream for them. Maria and Kazia will be lifelong friends. Having stricter compliance than the elementary school, the Russian rules for the gymnasium are relentless. Student chatter between classes must be in Russian. Maria writes, the morale no, the moral atmosphere was altogether unbearable, constantly held in suspicion and spied upon. Children knew that a single conversation in Polish or an imprudent word might seriously harm not only themselves but also their families. Amid these hostilities, the joy of life is lost, and childhood is weighted with precocious feelings of distrust and indignation weighed upon their childhood. On the other side, this abnormal situation resulted in exciting patriotic feelings of Polish youth to the highest degree. <clears throat> End quote. One abnormal situation is the time Maria's group sees that a friend has been crying. When the, girl, when the girls ask what is wrong, she replies, It's my brother. He was in a plot. He was denounced. We haven't known where he was for three days. They're going to hang him tomorrow. Maria, Hella, and Bronya and the others sit with their friend through the night. A normal situation is a sleepover of giggling girls who gossip into the morning hours. Instead, the girls are crying and praying for a miracle that the brother will be spared. No cries or prayers change what the Russians have ruled. A daily nemesis in the school is <clears throat> Mademoiselle Mayer, the superintendent of studies who has resolved to break Maria's stubborn spirit. Mayer believes the place to start is with Maria's unruly hair, calling it disordered and ridiculous. Mayer brushes Maria's hair trying to take the curl out and she then puts Maria's hair into tight braids. Mayer's intention is curtailed when wisps of Maria's curly hair pop out from the braid. When Maria, taller than her teacher, brings a paper over to where Mayer is standing, she tells Maria, I forbid you to look at me like that. You mustn't look down on me. Maria's wit, like her hair, springs out when she responds, The fact is, I can't do anything else. <laughs> Mayor, Mayor says of Maria, that Sklodowska, it's no use talking to her. It's just like throwing peas against a wall. <laughs> Mademoiselle Mayor has an additional duty. She's the hall monitor. Mayor spends time roaming the halls, watching for any rule breakers. When she checks on an empty room, she catches Maria and Kazia dancing. Maria writes later that they were dancing for joy, having found out that Tsar Alexander II had been killed by an assassin's bomb, March 1881. Maria and Kazia continued to be partners in crime for small acts of rebellion. Every day on their way to school, the girls pass, pass an obelisk that was raised by the Tsar to honor Poles who had stayed faithful to the Russians during the uprising. This monument has the inscription to the Poles faithful to their sovereign inscribed on it. For Polish patriots, these faithful Poles are considered traitors. The children's ritual is to spit on the obelisk every time they walk by it. One day, the girls realize they have passed the obelisk without spitting. They run back to rectify this oversight. <laughs> Maria's sadness has lightened, and she expresses her love of learning in a letter to Kazia. In spite of everything, I like school. Perhaps you'll make fun of me, but nevertheless, I must tell you that I like it, and even that I love it. I can realize that now. In her love of studying, Maria is able to maintain a deep concentration 
In one instance, while she is studying her lessons, Maria puts her thumbs in her ears to block out the noises of her cousins and sisters. The girls are stacking chairs behind Maria so that when Maria gets up, the chairs will crash to the floor and scare her. The crash occurs. The girls are howling in delight, expecting Maria to become unglued. She doesn't. She tells them, that was stupid, and walks away. Maria's hunger for knowledge isn't bound to the pages of books. She is in love with nature, trees, gardens, and flowers. Her aspiration for more education coincides with the rise in intellectualism. It is the positivist movement, the hope that Poland will rise again through science, logic, and education. Both Bronia and Maria support the ideals of the positivists who demand education for the poor, equal rights for women at work and school, and they want to see the Catholic Church become less powerful. The ultimate goal is changing the political system for Poland and a return to independence. Maria ends her secondary studies at the gymnasium in 1883. She is awarded a gold medal, best in her class. Maria ranks with Bronia and Joseph, who also received this honor, except Maria is finishing first when she is only 15, the youngest of her classmates. Vladislav wants his daughter to finally take a break. He knows Maria is both emotionally and physically exhausted. With his family outside of Warsaw, Vladislav arranges for Maria to have one year away in the countryside. And that ends chapter one. Thank you.